Hey guys, so right in front of me, I have eight different batters that represent eight different cultures idea of a perfect pancake. Today we're gonna try to make them all, taste them all, and then we're gonna compare them. But not to see which one's the best, because that's a subjective thing and that's something I want to know from you, actually. But because there's so much cool food and culture stuff to learn along the way. First of all, let's answer one very important question. What exactly is a pancake? That's kind of what I was wondering and that is what led me down this incredible research rabbit hole, looking into almost 30 different types of pancakes from around the world and oh boy, are those differences fascinating. We're gonna get into some of that, but first, if like the United Nations had to come up with one common definition for a pancake, I think this is kind of what it could look like. Number one, a pancake must contain at least one starchy ingredient, usually some type of flour. Number two, a pancake must contain at least one liquid ingredient. That's usually water, milk, something like that. Number three, the pancake batter must be thin enough that you can pour it. I think if you have to knead the dough or roll it out, that's where pancakes end and flatbreads begin. And finally, number four, a pancake must be cooked quickly on a hot flat surface. Now, I'm from Germany, but my family is originally from Russia, so it might not come as a big surprise to you that I grew up on my babushka's blini or blinchiki. That's a Russian style of pancake. So yeah, I might be biased, but I really think they are a perfect starting point on this world pancake journey. All right, Russian blini or blinchiki. They're as basic as it gets. Always start by mixing your dry ingredients first. That's wheat flour seasoned with salt and sugar in this case. Then we add our wet ingredients. An egg will bring snappy firmness to the pancake when it cooks and some softened butter adds richness. The base liquid here is milk, which I add bit by bit to avoid lumps until I have the consistency I am going for. The milk is mildly sweet and has a bit of fat for extra creaminess. And in terms of consistency, it is thin with five ends because you want to be able to pour the stuff directly onto the pan. And one more thing, guys. I'm not always a huge fan of nonstick pans, but in this case, please do yourselves a favor and get a nonstick pan. I got mine preheated on medium high and I'm still gonna go in with a little bit of clarified butter. With this pan, it's actually more for taste than anything else. Swirl it around to spread the batter into a very thin layer. Try to get it as even as possible, but don't worry if it's not perfect because pancakes are pretty forgiving. If you feel like your batter is too thick and it doesn't really spread around the pan, just add an extra splash of milk. If it's too thin, add a little bit of flour. You can tweak and adjust almost all pancake recipes as you go. So, you know, there are lots of second chances. So you wanna get a little bit of golden color on both sides. Flipping a thin pancake like this does take a little bit of practice, but if the bottom has properly cooked through and lightly browned, it's usually not that difficult. There are many ways to serve blini. Sometimes they're stuffed with sweet or savory fillings, but we're gonna keep it classic. We're gonna fold them in half twice and then top with sour cream and a little bit of jam. So to me, no doubt about it, when you say pancake, I will think of something like this. Like this is a good old blinchik. Okay, let me try this. This should taste like home. Lots of sour cream, lots of jam on this bite, just the way it should be. Oh, yes. Yes, 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 yes. Mm -hmm. Tender, buttery rich, very mild in flavor itself, but the amazing fruity sweetness of the jam with a little bit of that tang from sour cream, fantastic. I can't stop, but I have to stop because we have seven more pancakes from around the world ahead of us. So to me, aside from maybe the size, there's no real substantial difference between a Russian blin and a French crepe. But France cannot be missing in this video, and fortunately, France has another and pretty underrated pancake to share with the world. We are, of course, talking about the French galette. It's pretty much the same idea and also batter type as a crepe, but it uses buckwheat flour instead. And buckwheat has nothing to do with regular wheat, by the way. It's actually related to rhubarb, so completely different plant. So first we wanna prepare a crepe style pancake, just like we did with the blin, but that is only half the story. Galettes are traditionally served with savory toppings, like this traditional creamed spinach, comte cheese, and egg combo. We also need to fold it in this specific way, don't ask me where that's from, but that's how it's done. Not gonna lie, this smells incredible. Ooh, I am so looking forward to this. So I got myself an entire corner, steaming hot. Let's see what you taste like. 
I never had any doubts, but this confirms it for sure. I am 100% a savory pancake guy. This is amazing. Mm. So the pancake itself is as tender and as light as a crepe or a blin. However, it has a very like interesting, complex, nutty note, which I know not everybody's a fan of buckwheat, but it's good. All those rich toppings. I mean, so my verdict is that I love both the crepe and the galette. The difference is not huge. This one just has a little bit of a nutty note, but I think this one is perfect for savory fillings. Well, maybe the other ones are more suited for sweet stuff, but hey, there are no boundaries ever in the kitchen. All right, I think we've acquired some pretty substantial base knowledge and it's time to venture out a bit further in the world of pancakes. We've only used like grain flours as a pancake base so far, but what? if we change that up a little bit. Enter Venezuelan cachapas. I never made those before, so I am very curious because the base here is actually a can of sweet corn. Why not? I mean, it has starch as well, right? So you put that in a blender with a few of the other usual suspects. The only one of note here being a bit of masa flour instead of wheat flour, but you can substitute that with wheat flour in a pinch. We get a very thick paste that should still be a little bit chunky and then we form like a hand sized patty and fry it until almost charred on both sides melting like a layer of queso mano or in my case mozzarella on top and folding it a bit like a taco so this one i gotta admit it was really tricky i had to adjust the batter a few times with some extra masa to make it work but i think i got something yeah well this recipe needs some work this one i can't even fold but i'm gonna show you this one here it is, cute little pancake, almost taco, right? So if you're watching and you know how to make these properly, I'm actually interested in figuring this out. So make sure to let me know, but I'm gonna try this one now. Mm -hmm. Okay, taste-wise, this is good. Mmm, I think more cheese would be better even. So the flavor expectedly is very, very sweet, but this thing is also incredibly moist and juicy. And then of course, there's this like rich carpet of corn flavor that kind of works as a great foundation for the entire flavor of this thing. Very interesting. Very intriguing. As you can see, almost any starchy vegetable can indeed be pancaked. But what if we started thinking beyond ingredients and more in the direction of texture? Yes, I am talking about fluffy, spongy, leavened pancakes. Now, I'm sure we all saw that one coming, the classic American pancake. We've seen most of the ingredients before. The important difference would be the addition of both baking powder and baking soda, which will let the batter rise in the pan. Their alkaline quality is being balanced with buttermilk, which also gives American pancakes their signature tang. The batter here is significantly thicker than a blinz, but you need to hit that sweet spot where it's still runny enough to expand and form a perfect flat circle on the pan. You'll wanna get that pancake golden brown from both sides. These are super easy to handle and we all know how to finish this. Stack them up with a good knob of butter and a generous drizzle of maple syrup. All right, let's just go like this. I don't I don't even know. How do you even eat a stack of pancakes? Do you eat them at the same time? I think so. Show me what you got, American pancake. Okay, it's pretty damn good. <laughs> it's just, it's very fluffy. It's very, very fluffy. Honestly, much, much better than I remember American pancakes. Maybe I should eat them once in a while. Or maybe not. They're so fluffy and soft that they're almost silky. It's a thing of beauty. And I gotta say, maple syrup is my favorite sweetener of all time. I drink my morning coffee with a little dash of maple syrup and I love it. Why can't pancakes taste worse? All right, so we can use baking soda to leaven a pancake and make it fluffy. But what about a very different style of leavening? I'm talking yeast. And to explore how yeast works in a pancake, I would like to take you to the Horn of Africa, specifically to Somalia. The Somali Anjero is from the same family of pancakes as the Ethiopian injera that you might remember from my Ethiopian video. And it's the staple food of many people in the region. So I'm not quite sure how authentic this recipe is, but here's my shot at it. We begin by making a pre-ferment with corn flour, 
teff flour, that's a local grain, and yeast. After two hours, it got very bubbly and active, so I added wheat flour, sugar, and finally some water until we get a thickness that's somewhere between the blin and the American pancake. After another overnight rest, the batter is a super shaggy and frothy mess, as it should be, so we add a ladleful into the center of our pan and then try to spread it around in a spiral. I obviously need some practice, but the most important thing is achieved. There's contrast between those super spongy thicker parts and crispier thin bits. The anjero is done when the upper side is fully cooked, but you don't flip it to keep the top soft. It's getting really interesting because I have absolutely no idea what to expect from this. What does it even taste like? The way this would traditionally be served, as far as I could research, is with a little bit of butter and something sweet like honey. Ooh, very, very cool. Very, very cool. I believe that's how you do it. Just grab a piece with your hands. Mmm. It's very yeasty, which, I mean, that's no surprise. The fermentation has given it like a mild sourness. It pairs so well with the honey and the butter. Whoa, 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 whoa. Mmm. You can also taste that this is not just wheat flour. There's some other really interesting, more complex stuff. So. That's really cool, man. That's also definitely has a little bit of a chewiness. So before we close the chapter on leavened doughs, there's one that I simply couldn't miss in this video, and that's the Indian dosa. This one I have also never cooked before, and in fact, I might have never had one before. So I looked up the Serious Eats recipe, and it better be worth it because it is a process. We begin by soaking long grain rice and a sort of bean called urat dal with a pinch of fenugreek for a couple of hours, after which we blend it to a fine paste, helping ourselves with the soaking liquid from the dal. This batter now has to ferment in a warm place for at least 8 or up to 24 hours. It definitely had a sourdough type of smell to it, but I was actually expecting it to be much frothier and active. But anyway, the way you make this is a bit reminiscent of the Angero. You first spread some batter on the pan and swirl it around with the back of your ladle. Once the batter has fully set, you can spread some ghee on top and fry for a few moments longer. You can try making a roll out of it straight in the pan because the dosa sets and firms up extremely quickly as soon as it leaves the heat. So yeah, but this one, hey, that was really successful. Um, so this is cool. I think the fermentation definitely worked. It smells nice and toasty. That's good. So traditionally, you would enjoy this type of dosa with a coconut chutney or something like that. Um, or um, I made masala potatoes here. I was gonna put them inside. Masala potatoes inside a DIY dosa. Ooh, the excitement is real. Let's try. Mm. <laughs> First of all, these are some good masala potatoes, but the dosa is lovely. <laughs> here I have lots of dosa and just a little bit of masala potato. That's amazing. That is amazing. I need to try some of it plain. Mm. So first of all, it has this super delicious crunchy exterior. Those crispy bits are out of this world. It definitely has a nice tangy note from the fermentation and it pairs so well with intensely flavored Indian food. This is the surprise of the day for me. This is so good. So at this point, we've done all sorts of things with the batter, but there's one thing we haven't done yet, which is adding things into the batter. And one of the most common ways to do that would be to add potato. You will find recipes like that all over Europe and beyond, from the Jewish latkes to the German Kartoffelpuffer, but somehow this really, really seems to be a thing in Sweden, where these guys are called Ragmunk. I think that's how it's pronounced. It's basically just grated starchy potatoes held together by a pretty normal wheat flour pancake batter and then fried in loads of clarified butter. People of Sweden, how good is your pancake? Let's see. I get it. Mm. <laughs> the thing is, I think potatoes 
more than pretty much any other food. They have this ability to make food taste homey, cozy, and that's what's going on here. Like this very much is like a grandma meal. Like I, I, don't, I don't know, my grandma doesn't make these, I don't think, but <laughs> this tastes like my grandma could be making them. Swedish people, I like your pancake and let me tell you, it's worth trying this with applesauce. It's really good. <laughs> like, it's really good. So to end this epic journey into the world of pancakes with the bang that it deserves, there's one more thing we have to talk about. And yes, I'm talking about what might be the king of all mixed batter pancakes, the Japanese okonomiyaki. So the very original idea of okonomiyaki, and that's even in the translation of the name, is that you throw together everything you like, you drowse it, in a thick pancake batter and then it's cooked right in front of you like table side usually by yourself but sometimes also by a chef so obviously there are countless variations on the okonomiyaki but a classic one would look something like this you add cabbage scallions minced pickled ginger bonito tuna flakes and then this guy a chinese yam you want to grate it into the mix but be careful this stuff is very weird and almost like slimy but it gives this whole thing its signature texture so yeah then we're finishing this with some flour egg and dashi broth as our liquid base Okay, last, but definitely not least. Oh my God, it's moving. Anyhow, what was I saying? Uh, yes, okonomiyaki. Well, I've had this before, I love it. You should actually watch my takoyaki video if you're interested in a lot of techniques and things related to okonomiyaki as well. I mean, this might be one of my absolute favorite pancakes of all time. Itadakimasu. Boom, takes me right back to Japan with one bite. First of all, amazing base layer of umami thanks to the dashi stock in the batter. Some great crunch from the cabbage. And then of course, like layers and layers of amazing flavors. <laughs> the spicy ginger, the tangy and salty okonomiyaki sauce, the super umami and salty bonito flakes, those little like sharp accents of the green onions, the nori, mm. and of course, and of course the creamy rich mayo, mm. so good. I hope you guys enjoyed this journey into the fabulous world of pancakes. I mean, there are so many more in the world um, that you could probably dedicate a whole channel just to pancakes. Let me know in the comments what your favorite is, if I was missing anything in the ones that I made, and hope you're subscribed and hit the bell so you don't miss the next video because there is so much good food in the world. See you there.